And we are live, people. Welcome to HESI Review Week 10. I'm Professor Jennifer Harrison Hara. Sharing um, my screen. Let me I had one it. question. I'm listening. I can multitask. Um, so on the remediation, if we get <clears throat> over 900, do we just do one hour or nothing? Whatever the guidelines are, I don't have a memorized for you. It just so it ends at 899 and says two hours, and there's nothing above it. It's an hour. Do an hour. Okay. I'm thinking there's gotta be something. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But again, I would I would connect with your man. I would definitely connect with your campuses on that as well. It's a whole thing. Can everyone see my slide? Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. Let's get into it. Has a review. So this entire course is about community health nursing. All right. So what is, and it's going to be interactive. What is community health nursing? That should be something that we all at this point, 10 weeks into it should like, oh, okay. They're focused on the community. They, they want the community to be healthy. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So just know. And oh, oh, let me back up. So you'll get a copy of this um, YouTube link. I'm not able to share the actual PowerPoint, but you'll have the link to view, review over and over and over to your heart's content. So when you think of community health nursing, know that we're focused on the health and well-being of community members. So it's not individual focus, it's everyone in the community. That's, that's what we're striving for, for folks to be as healthy as possible. And so you want to think they're listing three specialty, let me admit someone here, they're, they're listing three specialty areas that you, they want you to be aware of. And that is public health nursing, your school health nurse, and then you're, you're, you're a nurse that works in the workplace. So those are three, three areas that you, you'll definitely find um, community health nurses of, or sub health, of subtypes of community health, like your school nurses. Her kids are her community, part of her community. And so, why, what's going on with my, my clicker? All right, we'll click that way. All right, you guys. Slides are gonna get busy. So the philosophy, again, we are wanting people, everyone in our community to, to live the best possible life as long as possible, as healthy as possible. We believe that that is their God-given birthright. And so what can we do as community health nurses to, to make sure that they, they get close to that goal as possible? So it's prevention, prevention, prevention on various levels. We're looking at um, promoting health. We're looking at screenings. We're looking at tertiary, whatever they are to where they can live the best life that they possibly can. And so in order to do that, when you guys, and again, some of these, this, this should all be a review. That's why they're calling it a HESI review. At this point, you shouldn't be like, what's primary? What in the world is she talking about? This is week 10. So it shouldn't be anything too terribly new. So when you go into your community, guys, before you even go in, you have to do, just like when you go and you review your charts, well, I don't know how you guys do it over there, before you do your clinicals and you gather your information on your patients so that when you actually go to the floor, you, you, know, you know about what's going on with them. So that's what you're doing here. You're gathering data, you're, you're looking at census, you're interpreting data, and this is nothing too convoluted because you wanna come to some type, you wanna come to health problems and issues that you need to address. So you don't wanna just walk in not knowing anything about mortality rates, safety, environmental, that sort of stuff. So you wanna gather information so this particular slide lists information that you need to obtain. Some of the things, highlights, you wanna know what's the age of the resident? Why is not that the median age is 25? Why aren't people living to be elders? So you wanna look at their age, the gender, 
socioeconomic, racial distribution, vital statistic stuff, what's killing them, what chronic conditions are they dealing with. So in my notes here, I have during a community assessment, the nurse will perform data gathering and data generation. So she's gonna gather it and she's gonna analyze it. Um, data generation is a process of identifying data that does not exist, but is developed through interactions with the community. So like you say, you're sitting down, you're talking to people, you're finding out their norms, that sort of thing. So examples of data generation could include what are their values? What do the community value in that? What do they believe? What are their social norms? Just like most of you know that I work on a reservation, They're, they have their values, they have their beliefs, they have their norms. I'm not trying to change their customs. I just need to understand so that when I go out and do a health education or what have you, I don't come in, well, for lack of a better word, ignorant, which is ignorant means lack of knowledge. It's not a bad word. It just means you lack knowledge. So you want to be knowledgeable of your community. So this is the process of collecting information. Sometimes data gathering, you, you, the information exists. You're gathering that information, um, such as the age, like I said, the racial distribution. So data gathering is when you pull information from vital stats or what have you, like census. And then data generating, you're sitting down, let's just say with the elders, you're finding out about the history, the cultures, what do they believe and what have you. None of this should be new. And again, they talk, we're getting into the data generation slide. And this, these are examples, the norms, who's, who's the power, who's in charge in the community, in the village, what are their values? What do they believe? And so um, those are the things to, to keep in mind. So again, data generation, again, our information about the community values, beliefs, social norms. Gathering is where you're looking at the census records, you're pulling out different things, you're pulling out morbid morbidity rates, accidents, suicide rates, that sort of stuff. All righty, primary prevention. Primary prevention is listed here for you. There doesn't exist, there's no, you're not looking for a disease. You're not screening for anything. A disease does not exist. So primary prevention, again, you're looking at education and of the about prevalent conditions. So let's just say if there's high rate of suicide, then you may be educating about those sort of things or high rates of um, COVID, you're doing education to prevent, you're providing vaccines. Uh, you can be seen, you can certainly work at health departments and clinics. Is someone talking or muted? Please. Oh, my mute. All right, moving on. All right, primary prevention. Any question about primary prevention? Secondary screening, S, screenings. All right, so keep in mind, if you see a question, I mean, again, I don't think anyone wants to trip anybody up about things, um, but again, you wanna first think, think to yourself, is there a disease that exists? that would be tertiary. And then you gotta think, are they looking for a disease? And that would be screening like mammogram or you know, pap smear. And then when you think of primary, you're trying to prevent anything from occurring. So you're either trying to teach and educate people so they can do better, make better choices, or give them a vaccine to try to help out with that. So that's your secondary. In tertiary, you notice there's a lot more, it's a lot busier. Because anytime you have a chronic condition, you're gonna be busy. Anybody that's dealt with, um, anyone with diabetes, anybody with cancer, anybody with any, any high blood pressure, hypertension is a chronic disease. So you notice that this slide is a lot busier 
than the other slides, which begs the question is that you really, in, in a perfect world, want to focus your efforts on primary so that tertiary doesn't even exist. So that's like my perfect, that's my, that's not my perfect world or what have you. So you're listing here, you're looking at, so as a community health nurse, if you have a patient that has an amputee, diabetes or what have you, you you're gonna get them to read, you're coordinating. You can't do everything yourself, you know? So just think of that. You're, think of that as a community health nurse, you are like the queen or king of resources. You're getting on your phone, you're connecting and making sure they're getting to their specialized care, to their dialysis, to their, to their rehab. Um, and so you're getting them the services that they need so they can live the best possible life with their diabetes, with their hypertension, with all of that. So then um, you're getting them to home health, helping them with mobility. You're getting them to um, their specialty appointments. I think I said that enough. All right. So now this is a new slide. And my thing about slides and, and reviews, if it's here, they want you to know it. For whatever reason, it is not up to me. So RAM stands for Remote Area Medical. I have actually participated in a RAM as a nurse practitioner with, um, with my, I'm active duty. And so just think of it as free medical care to the community. So as a community health nurse, if you were living in Cookville, Tennessee or surrounding counties, and you know that your, your patient hasn't been to the dentist in a minute, you're gonna get them to that RAM. You're gonna get them to get their free eyeglasses. You're gonna get them see free medical women's health. So I've done pap smears, all free, all free, all free. So again, know this slide, it, the link will be sent to you. I don't wanna, I wouldn't let it keep me up at night, but just know that, that it's, RAM stands for Remote Area Medical, where a bunch of people come together. Think about it as a medical mission and a local area. So, all right. And then health promotion, health promotion, health promotion. We're always going to be focusing on making sure that patients they, they take ownership. They, they have to do the certain things themselves. Um, they have to want the desire to um, work on their diabetes and what have you. So just know that you want to know the term, which is the process of enabling people to increase control of health. So a lot of times for me, when I do health promotion, it just depends on what I'm, what I'm educating and teaching them about. So if it's um, primary or secondary or tertiary, you know, if you don't control your high blood pressure, you can have a stroke and die. And death is pretty permanent, last time I checked. So just, you know, you don't have to put the, the death on them unless it's applicable, um, but they have to take ownership. So they have to change their behavior. They have to be motivated. And that's something that happens with, within. But just know that um, you never give up on folks and you always you know, promote better health so they can live a better life. Don't you wanna see your grandkids get older and this, that, and the other? Those sort of things, okay. So the image here is just an example. It is nothing that you have to memorize, but this is the little tidbit on environmental component of community health nursing. So from my notes, environmental, you want to, when you go in and do your assessments, even if you're, if you're doing researching or if you're going out into a home, you're going to see things such as if there's a wood stove, what needs to be done as far as standard um, assessments, making sure there's annual things that need to be done. Again, you're not actually checking the wood stove, but you're coordinating and making sure things are done. So just know that community health, public health, is holistic, so there is an environmental component. There's primary, secondary, and tertiary to every single component that we do. So again, assessing for sources of unintentional poisoning, such as mercury from fish or lead from paint. 
How would you know that? Well, I've gone out with an environmental health officer on a reservation at one of my one of my patients' homes. And she was in a home in the, I think, 40s or what have you. And a child, there was a child there with high lead levels. So she tested the house. I didn't test it, but I worked with her on it. So then you're just making sure that all of this gets, not all of it, but again, um, storing medicine, preparing food, any environmental concern. Again, this is an example of what you would be assessing when you go out into the home and then how they get that need taken care of, you need to pull from your resources. So this slide, slide everybody should be familiar with here, okay? So then when you, we're talking about, we're going into the epi component again, all right? So it talks about existing pathogens and antibodies. You don't have to memorize this slide, but the next one, we should definitely know about the chain the epi triangle. Who wants to tell me about the epi triangle while I take a breath? Or I can call on names. We tested on this. Um, do you mean the um, agent, host, and the environment? Yes, the agent, host, and the environment. All righty. Give me an example of an agent, Ashley. Um, the agent is where it started, like what it is and what it started. Could you be an agent? Um, probably not originally. I'd have to get it from somewhere, right? There you go. There you go. All right. Give me an example. She's like, oh my gosh. Okay. Andrea of a host. Um, us. Yeah, we are the we are the host, mm -hmm. and then agent, the host, and then Miss Lyons. What are we missing? The reservoir or where it's actually like the agent, the host, the environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the reservoir. Okay, the reservoir. reservoir. She's using fancy words here. I love it. We can handle that. <laughs> we can have it. So the epi triangle focus on three elements, the agent, host, and environment that influence the occurrence of a disease. The host is the living species capable of being infected. This cannot, can y'all see me? My phone cannot be a host. It can have germs on it though, but it's not living, so living. Okay, and then um, the agent is the factor that must be present for the disease to occur, such as bacteria, viruses, what have you. And the environment is the internal or external factor that influences the disease, such as plant, water, or like Ms. Lyons was saying, reservoir. So those, that's the, that needs to, when, when designing an epi study for the first time, the Ecologic design is the best to use. Okay, all right. The ecological design is quick, easy, and reliable, readily available uh, existing information. Do you guys remember us talking about the e ecological design at all? It's not on the slide, but it's just, it was one of the different design studies that was used where you have, you, you're able to pull from existing data I'm not gonna get into too much. It's not on the slide, but it's just something we, we tested on with this epi section. But if they're continuing with epidemiology, so let's just say focus on that. I don't, I don't wanna sidetrack for us. So how can we change things? What are the associations? What are our levels of prevention? So when you're thinking about the, the triangle, if any of those, any of those are out of balance, then that's how you break the chain, if that makes sense. Um, it's a complex relationship between the casual, casual agents, susceptible persons, and environmental factors. So if you, if you have an agent and you have a reservoir, but the person is not susceptible, their immune system is high, they don't put themselves, I don't want to get into COVID, but I guess, you know, they wear a mask or what have you. I've known 
many of my friends who did not get COVID. And I have many of my friends that got it three, two, three times. So not to get into how or what have you, but that's that's the triangle that needs to be broken at some one or all of the levels and what have you. So the associations between risk, what are the risk factors that put that person like, so again, your vulnerable populations that we all talked about, um, that increases their risk for disease, morbidity, and mortality. Um, so primary level of prevention should focus on education. Secondary should focus on screenings. Tertiary level prevention focuses on treatment and evaluation of outcomes. So primary focuses on prevention, such as education. So if you had to try to memorize this for one final time, like primary education, or if you could do primary education vaccine. And then secondary, you're looking at screenings. And as women, we know screening, 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 pap, 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 looking for cervical cancer. So I always tell folks when I do their paps, it's a screening. It doesn't tell you that you have it. It is screening. And if it's abnormal, you have to do like a corposcopy where they actually do biopsies. Just like if you find a lump, it could be a cyst. What could be stage four cancer? I don't know. The mammogram just tells me it's abnormal. We have to actually get a piece of that meat. So I don't want to digress there. So the chain, you need to, we need to break the chain. If you find out how to break the chain, just like if somebody in your house has COVID, you can break the chain by putting them in isolation <laughs> and staying away from them, you know, so so that you don't you don't get it. All right. Um, so again. I remember seeing something like this in one of our chapters. You're looking at specialty areas and topics of infections. Know that on the right, for example, there are diseases that are reportable. I don't think you need to memorize it, but there are certain diseases that you have to report to the CDC. That's how we know things about hepatitis and salmonella. Just like you see on the news or you read, it's been a similar outbreak on lettuce in California and all this and other stuff, stuff, or what have you. And so keep that in mind. And then as far as specialty diseases, there's some that you can tackle with vaccines like hepatitis, I think hepatitis A, some there are not. Um, there are respiratory. Some are reportable. Um, so keep that in mind. And some are used for, you know, terrorism. So just know that there are reportable diseases out there that we that's how they get numbers about things. And so if you're looking at what this slide talks about and hails about the benefits of, of immunizations, and just know that if you're, for example, if you're a community health nurse and you're working in the schools, you're gonna make sure your kids have their recommended vaccines. You're keeping some kind of chart or what have you to prevent any type of outbreaks or conditions at your school. So keep that in mind. Does anyone know, I'm just gonna throw out a question, um, as far as hepatitis is concerned, hepatitis B vaccine, what, um, it says allergic reaction. What what is con? And if you don't know, it's fine. Do you know what the true the contraindication is for hepatitis B that someone if they're allergic to this, they can't receive it. If you don't know, it's okay. If they're allergic to yeast, I might put that back there somewhere, or what have you. So if you're allergic to yeast. You can't receive the hepatitis B vaccine. Okay. All right. Because they talk about allergic reactions here. So again, if someone had an allergy to yeast, they cannot receive the hepatitis B vaccine. That is listed in my notes for whatever reason. So those are examples of an allergic reaction from a skin allergic reaction, because people can, you know, have other things like hives and what have you. It's very busy, but we talked about VARS, Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. 
Are we familiar with VERS? And this is rainwater. It's rain water. Rain. Just to let you guys know. Did you actually know they sell rain water? They do. My kids turned me on to that. So VARS is a national vaccine safety surveillance. That's how they find out reactions that people receive from various vaccines. When I did my COVID at work, I, um, they gave me the information to sign up for with my phone, like text now to something, something. And so every few weeks, I would get a text from CDC. How are you feeling after your COVID vaccine? It's been one week, two weeks, three weeks. Are you having these symptoms? And so that's how they gather that surveillance information. So you want to know VARS, what it stands for, Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. It's national. Anybody that gives vaccines should be have access to this so that if the patient were to have a reaction, they need to report it. It does not, um, what does it say on here? It does not mean the vaccine caused the event. So that's an when I, when I have patients report it, they think, oh my God, that's it. No, they just want to gather the information. They're just gathering information. So that's how we find out things about vaccines. Now this slide lists one, two, three, four, five different types of conditions and their incubation times. So if it's on here, there's a reason they, it's on here. For flu, incubation time is one to four days, anthrax, one to seven, antivirus I've never encountered, one to four, tuberculosis, two to three weeks, and SARS, two to seven days. So SARS started out with severe acute respiratory syndrome. It's a viral respiratory condition. It is started in China, well, first emerged in China, I don't know where it started, 2002. I don't know, I remember when they started talking about SARS 21 years ago. Um, it spread internationally to 29 countries, causing a large outbreak um, in Asian countries, and there were 774 people died. So SARS is listed on here. So that means it's, you could see it again. What was the incubation time for SARS, Professor? Incubation time for SARS was, let me go back. Oh, I don't wanna lie to you. I believe it was two to seven days. And you guys will get the link for this as well. So SARS is two to seven days. All right, COVID. Three years March, right? It is, you want to know that it is part of the SARS virus family. So they already know that. Symptoms may appear two to 14 days after you are exposed. If we don't have the symptoms memorized by now, oh my goodness, I don't know how many patients I had to triage. You have a cough, so it's any place you go. If you have any of these symptoms, stop. Don't come in. Um, it is transmitted human to human via respiratory droplets. That is why they encouraged us to wear masks for 30,000 years. So. And then you have your flu A and B. The symptoms can mimic others, such as your fever and chills, malaise, aches, tiredness. I've had patients that have COVID and flu. So. It's in red here, can be severe or deadly for children. The elderly sounds like our vulnerable people again, right? Um, your flu vaccine, nothing's 100%. There are antivirals that can be given as well, the Tamiflu and what have you. Now, why this slide is here, I don't know, but it is here. So we're gonna talk about it. So this is, a slide talking about pneumonia. And my note, this is mild cardiopathy, cardiomegaly, right-sided lung. I wouldn't memorize the image so much, but I would know that if they're talking about pneumonia, to me, if I'm thinking about community health nursing, I'm thinking about vaccines. I'm thinking about uh, pneumovax. 
Um, there are, if you're age 60 or 65 older, they highly recommend it. And then um, for, I'm not gonna get into the CDC guidelines because again, I just would know pneumonia and then there is a vaccine for it and that your elderly should definitely receive it. And there's always some asterisks of who can get it earlier than 65 and what have you. So no fat, tuberculosis. In our clinic, we actually, we don't do the skin test anymore. Do you guys, anybody work in a clinic where they're doing the skin test still? I had a skin test for school. Recently? Yeah, yeah I have we, are do, we have to do it every year. We, I just had to get mine like six weeks ago. A two-step skin test, that is. You can't just go once, you have to go twice. Yep. Quantiferin, you got us, guys aren't doing quantiferin? No, if you can get a quantiferin gold blood drop from your physician, you can submit that to the school. But if you don't have the blood draw, then you have to get the two-step TB test, which is the skin test one week and then go back and have the second one the following week. So I was, I stopped being eligible for the skin test. Ooh, don't make me lie. Maybe late 1990s, I converted. My first job ever as an LPN was on a respiratory floor. If you give me a skin test, it'll get that big. So I have to do, I did the quantiferon to start working here and then, or a chest x-ray. No, no, I haven't had a skin test and ooh, before the war now. So, so yes, yes, yes. So tuberculosis, there's that um, skin test. So my notes for this one is skin test and follow-up screening x-ray if needed. Uh, and then that's what I have for this one. So just know. Zika. Must, I took care of a couple of patients on the reservation with Zika, not recently, but for me, when I look at all of the different viruses, especially when it, what it the transmission and what, how it was um, transmitted from one person to the next, the mosquito-borne viral infection, it's, this mosquito carries it in bites you and what have you. But look at the symptoms. Flu-like symptoms, um, new info may have some, it may be, it may cause neural conditions. I've taken care of one patient in my life with Guillain Barre. And so knowing that these, some of these viruses conditions can mimic others, you just, we have a panel. You just want to test folks. It's some, sometimes it's like you're swabbing, you're doing all this and that and the other because you just, you don't know. That's why I don't know. For us, they ask if you've traveled out of the country recently. We're so close to Mexico, that's out of the country, but I am hour and a half from Mexico on, on the border. So, so we're, we're, we're familiar with Zika and, and what have you. Um, it can be detrimental to a pregnant woman causing the microcephaly, small brain. So um, we're definitely, definitely heighten awareness on the reservation and it's just a warm climate uh, so keep that in mind that it is one of the viruses that um, can mimic flu-like symptoms i've taken care of dengue so dengue is another mosquito born mild so there you go with your flu-like symptoms again there look at that slide there it can mimic so many things can mimic so many other conditions. But if you're looking at your two mosquito borns, they're talking about Zika and they're talking about dengue. And so, it, yeah, it is an emergency condition. Symptoms, again, could mimic that of the flu. So you just, you always want to just be aware, especially during, I don't know, like wherever, if you were to work as a community health nurse, we know certain times of the year where we're, aware of Rocky Mountain spotted fever, dengue seems to be more prevalent, but just, just know that it is what the second mosquito condition that they're talking about here. And then we got tick, we got Lyme. I've been taking care of a Lyme patient. I don't know if we still see that as much, but if you're in areas, again, that's why you wanna know your community. If you're in areas where tick-borne conditions are prevalent, you know, parts of Arizona, we have um, 
mountains, believe it or not, mountains and it snows and there's deer and tick and all that kind of stuff. So it is tick-borne. It's caused by a bacterium that I cannot pronounce that's listed on the screen for you. The symptoms, the only thing that would stand out that, that wouldn't mimic anything else is that that erythema, that rash that it causes is classic. And then there's treatment if you get them, you know, get them in time so you can prevent, that's that word again, you know, complications and what have you. But that's your tick-borne Lyme. And there's my Rocky Mountain spotted fever. I, we had an outbreak. We had an outbreak of Rocky Mountain spotted fever. And so we were at the rodeo grounds. Um, the, the res has an annual rodeo over three to four days. And so we, public health nurse, we had a booth about Rocky Mountain spotted fever and education. And we had little trinkets to give out to the kids and toys and da 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 da. And so um, there you go. So for, for Rocky Mountain Squatty Fever, there's your tick born. Can take 21 days for symptoms. Usually the tick must be attached for 24 hours for the tick. I hope y'all don't, don't need to eat. Usually the tick must be attached for 24 hours for tick saliva to transmit the bacterium. Um, and so one of the notes here is that some people teach to circle the date of the, the, the tick bite and then count 21 days. Uh, anyway, you don't need to know about circling the, we nurses have different ways of doing things. But anyway, just know that it is one of your tick born. And so you wanna ask about any history of tick bites and what have you. And now we're gonna, don't even ask me, pronounce this one. I have never seen it before in my life. It must be one of those. This would be a disease of exclusion where you ruled out everything else. Ehrlichiosis. No, it's tick-borne. So you have another tick-borne and it's caused by that bacteria that's listed. The Lone Star Tick, it has a name. Flu-like symptoms, you can't go wrong with flu-like symptoms. If you're like, if you forget anything, you just, you just, you can't remember, you want to remember flu-like symptoms, okay? Um, begin about seven to 14 days after the tick bite. Still the same medicine as Doxy. And then complications, God love them. It doesn't look good. So know that is one of your tick-borne conditions. And then we're going to move into, you know what? Well, going back, I guess we didn't move into, you know what? Hang on, let me go back. All right, so it gives us an image here. Let me just say this, that this is obviously the STI slide. I was thinking we had another slide after it that talked about STI, but we did not. So back to, majority of them are, reportable. Um, and so you want to, if you have an area that, again, I would say if you have an area that's high in chlamydia, you want to do a lot of education in the schools and screenings at the schools if they allow you to. We would, we, when we had high rates of um, incidence of um, new STI cases, we would, we would go out into communities and do education and screenings as well. Um, and know that some of these like syphilis, HIV, I don't have it memorized, but some, some conditions can be transmitted to fetus in utero. So that's what I would know from the slide is that uh, many of them are reportable like HIV, syphilis, what have you. Um, if you have a high, a high rates of new cases, you want to do your education. You want to do primary and, and do some screenings and capture, see if you can capture some new cases there and get, get it under control. And then that there is such thing as vertical transmission from mom to baby with some of these conditions. So we just have one slide that really talks about STIs. 
And then it moves into community assessment. So we're on slide 32 and we have 50 something slides to go. If you need to use the bathroom, come back, please. Um, and so community assessment is the, what do I, the bread and butter of what a community health nurse does, okay? And there are many different, I know we talked about it earlier in the slide, but they really harp on the fact that you want to, you want to know what's going on with your community from, from the beginning. And so when you're looking at this screen here, this little image about the eco map, have you guys ever heard of an eco map where they talked about an eco map? Eco, eco stands for ecological. No. So my notes here is an eco map is a structural diagram of a client's most important relationships with people, groups, organization, identities, resources available in the communities, clients' community. So let's just say I put Miss Ola Kunle in the middle. So I'm talking to her and I'm finding out she likes to go to Bible study, she likes to go to school, <laughs> or she's in school. She is in a book club. It's like intimately getting to know that person. So you may see a, a question on an eco map. You can do an eco ecological. You could put the family in the middle. You can put, let's just say your client. And then it's just like, these are the things that are important to her. And we've never actually done an actual eco map, but just know if it's here, they're wanting you to know it. So if you do a family ecological map, you're looking at what is important to that group. Are they, what organizations, like are they heavily faith-based? And I don't wanna say heavily faith-based. What, what are their beliefs? What are, what are their resources? So it's like you put that person or that group in the middle. And I don't, I try to make this slide a little bit bigger, but the only things I can make out is Bible study is important to this lovely lady school. I see book club, I see work or what have you. So just know what that ecological model map is. I would know it. Hint, hint. Community assessment. We should have seen this. This slide should be very, 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 very familiar. Because in the middle is your healthy community. Like that's your goal. And these are all the different pieces of the pie that need to be somehow addressed in your community assessment. Like you can take the spiritual and wellness piece and you can break it down into are there, what is, what is the predominant religion? What churches, what are people, because you can do, I've done many presentations in churches and, and faith-based groups and civic groups and what have you. If that helps me get to that middle of that circle, and then what are opportunities for folks? Are they having to travel three, four, five miles just to get a job and come back home? And so that's, 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 that's what you want. That, these are the little pieces of that pie to make that community healthy and whole. So when completing a community assessment, the nurse would include community system categories within a community. So you wanna know politics, you wanna know education, you wanna know recreation. Where, you know, is there a safe place for the kids to play? Uh, are there, you know, places for folks to work and, and, and you know, um, go out to eat? Are they healthy restaurants and religion? You, you guys get the gist of it. So then they talk about community health peas. So community health peas. I think of the school health nurse that just comes to my mind right off the bat. Um, there's scoliosis screenings. Remember, she's trying screening, so she's secondary. I, how many of us, you can just raise your hand, I can see you. I rem, I'm a little bit older. I don't know, I'm older than most of you guys. I remember when you did scoliosis screenings in the high in the middle school. Anybody else? Middle school, yeah, bend over. Checking your spine, all this other stuff. I had a um, classmate that had to wear a brace 
you know, back then it was cool, but now it's probably was archaic looking. He just looked like a tin man in this in this thing for his scoliosis. Uh, teaching about basic hygiene and if you doing head lice checks and um, lead poisoning screenings as far as making sure that they're getting done. I'll, anytime you're a community person, whether you're stationed in a school, you're stationed in a church, you're stationed in um, Fifth and West Street, I don't know, I'm just making up something or what have you. There's no way you can possibly do every single thing that's needed besides your community assessment. Your community assessment is like, okay, I've done it. This is what my community needs. Now you got to go out and try to make it happen. And I used to work with, again, um, dentist school, nursing schools to come out and do blood pressure screenings and coordinate health fairs. And you're not doing everything by yourself, but you're realizing that you, you need this particular service. So you'd be surprised the number of organizations that, that are um, not for profit and they're looking to come out and do some public service, like that RAM would be a perfect example of um, coordinating a RAM for your area. You're like, okay, how do I get a RAM to my people out here? Send. So that's what you're, you're doing. So your community health piece, again, they have their special needs as well because they're school-aged and they're growing. And again, you see what's listed like the scoliosis, the lice check and what have you. And then again, they talk about the common complaints that a school nurse, oh, that eye looks vicious. Yeah, that child should not be in school. And so she's gonna um, be dealing with a lot of my stomach aches, my head aches, and even um, um, ADHD or um, different conditions as well, making sure the kids have their follow-up appointments working with the parents, you can't work, you know, you, so you're coordinating with the parents and helping them as well. And then keeping those conditions home and doing education to parents and reminding them they have pink eye, they need to not be at school. Slide 36, has anyone seen acanthosis nigricans? Nigri 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 I don't like to say that word, sorry. Has anyone seen this condition ever? Anyone want to tell me? No, never seen it in a doctor's office. Never looked. It's not just specific to dark skin picture people, but that's the the that's a really good slide of it. Um, it's a condition that's associated with it's a skin condition, and it's associated with obesity and obesity and insulin resistance, and they have a really high prevalence of going on to um, develop type two diabetes. So again, it's thick, dark skin, thick, velvety skin. I usually look at folks' neck. I see it a lot with my Native Americans. I don't know, because we have high rates of, of diabetes as well. Um, but usually to, if you're seeing this in pediatrics, you wanna definitely, you, or any case, you wanna definitely help that family to work with you know, weight loss. And um, because obesity and insulin resistance tend to, put people at that pre-diabetes and what have you. So this is like your opportunity. This is a, a screening that could be done and you can stop that tertiary diabetes condition from happening, but you got to get to them in time. All right, so let's see. And then teen health. If anyone's been around teens, you know, they're, I love them, they're a special, special group. Nothing's going to happen to them. They're going to live forever. They're fearless. Maybe they wear a seatbelt. Maybe they won't wear a seatbelt. They know absolutely everything. <laughs> they know everything. But any, any time you have a, so community health nursing is a specialty. And you may find yourself, again, focusing on faith-based. So you're, that's your area. And you're focusing on the schools. So if you're in a middle school, that's you're going to be with you're going to be with teens or in high school or what have you so every every little subgroup gets a slide gets some type of attention so again 
you're working with the parents, but you're also working closely with the teens too, because they're at the age where they they can understand, they they can understand and comprehend and what have you. So you want to do teaching on safety, 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 um, trauma. Um, they have higher rates of accidents, unfortunately. Um, there are teens that are homeless. Um, there are teens that are sex trafficking, homicides, suicides, all of those things. These are these are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven little bullets of education events that can that can happen at any given day at any type of high school or middle school all over the great United States of America. So there's opportunities there for your primary. There are opportunities for your secondary. And then again, if someone's positive on their suicide test or what have you, you know, you're not being the psychiatrist, but you're you're making sure that kid gets help ASAP. You're working with the parents as well. Um, if insurance an issue, there's there are usually low cost, you're getting the, them the care that they need. Um, and like I said, if, if whatever community health is not, she is definitely, she knows her resources. She knows who to call to get that service for that particular individual. So again, suicide, safety, cigarettes, all of those things, because they're, they're not babies. And some of them think they're adults, but they're not quite adults. And so you'll find family dynamics too. They They've been kicked out the house, they're, they're homeless, or this, that, and the other. So just know that they have special, special needs as well. So education, education for preteens, education, period. There is a, do they talk about the healthy people on this one? I'm sure there is a healthy people somewhere out there, but let me just see. Um, Alcohol and drug focused and violence and education. So safety is their big, I don't have it written down. I don't think you need to memorize the exact goal, but it's going to be focused on education, safety of alcohol and drug violence prevention. And then why is adolescent young health important? It talks about here on this slide is that it is a critical they're in a transition. That's what Miss Lyons was just mentioning and what have you. They're they're trying to figure. I mean, I don't know. Maybe I was there, but you're trying to figure things out. Usually at maybe at 16, you got a got a little job after school. Maybe you got a if you're lucky enough, you can drive your parents' car. I had to take the bus until I was able to get a car and what have you. So you're like, think you're grown-ish if you're not at all. And so adolescent is a critical transitional period that includes the biological changes of puberty. And my notes also say developmental tasks such as, and it's listed on the slide for you too, um, normative exploration, their learning, their testing, their pushing their boundaries. Um, young adults who have reached the age of majority, I'm thinking we're talking about, 18, also face significant social and economic challenges with few organizational supports at that time, which basically means when you become an adult, most places are like, okay, you're an adult. You're 18, but you're an adult. So again, they can, they'll still need our help. And then just talking a little bit about, um, we've all seen the, the food guide pyramid as well. So making sure folks have access to healthy nutritional options. I link my folks to so many different church based faith food give out, pantries, you know, just provide that information. Like, did you know the church around the corner has the fresh vegetables every Tuesday and Thursday? A lot of people don't know, like, just stuff like that, or they get busy with life and they forget. So you're coordinating, coordinating those things, getting people meals on wheels getting folks connected to, to, to what they need. If they're still, a lot of my, my moms on the res, they'll, they forget that they can stay on WIC and they're eligible until their child is five. They'll, they know about the pregnancy, 
they know about the free formula, but then it's around two or three, it just drops off. And they can literally keep that service for, and that's free food in the house. So just also just making sure people are aware of what's out there for them. So for our coordination of care, that's, that is us guys and gals in the middle. We are the, we coordinate care for our community, for our clients to get the services that they need. This is a perfect example. She's talking to like on the bottom right, she's talking to the hospice. The hospice is exchanging information with her help. Ooh, it's a reciprocal relationship. That's what this slide mentioned. So we are seen as leaders. We're the advisory role and um, we wear the role of our nurses as well, making sure that we get the resources that is needed. And we're also advising others in the communities about our clients. So we're, we're that um, leadership. You can think of liaison, you can be coordinator. And then we're working with all of these different entities as well. Sometimes, well, most of the time, multidiscipline as well, especially if you have, let's say somebody on hospice, you're dealing with the organization, dealing with the hospital, you're trying to you know, get all these rehab services, well, not rehab, or services that they need. So just know that. I worked as a community health nurse. I loved it. I loved it, loved it, loved it. Did it for like eight years. So now this slide, it looks busy, but it's really not that busy. This slide is focused on ger a geriatric perspective of a community health nurse. So they are looking at all of the different things that can that you may do, because as we get older, you know, they have one or two or three or four or five conditions that you're helping to coordinate with the family and everything else there. So you're doing blood pressure screenings. You're doing um, you can you may even have to do foot exams. I've done them. And it sounds more like home health, but we talked about that as well. So it keeps you busy, busy. I don't want to say busy er depends on their depends on their conditions. Um, you may um, they may need labs for um, hypertension or what have you. But just so know that with community health, there there are a lot more coordination of care that's oftentimes needed. And then you may not be the only nurse that comes in and out or um, healthcare person as well. So then with any of your population, whether it's teens or what have you, you gotta know your resources. So for me, when I was working with elderly in, com in the community, I know that they have a, um, I don't wanna, for lack of a better word, I, they call it different things, but like more like elder care where they actually brought out hot meals twice a day for the elders in their community. So they're divided into, I don't know, like districts, you know, like know, districts, like little cities. So they actually have um, four or five locations where they can come in and receive their meals or they have um, assistance or social workers a social assistant to actually take out. So they get two hot meals during the week to have bag lunch, lunches as well on the weekend. And so you wanna know what resources are available so you can get that started for them. And then also, I mean, no one is prone to depression and grief as well. So we, we don't wanna forget about that holistic um, piece uh, coordinating for mental health services also. Um, you may be able to coordinate that with, again, if they're church-based or faith-based, um, have their pastor or clergy visit them at the house. And then um, just knowing that usually in many, many communities, there, there are elder-focused agencies out there. And whenever I have a client that needs it, I have, you'll get to know people, they'll get to know you. And I say, I have a new client, I really want you to come out and and just check her out and, and see what, what, what services you guys have that, that the family can, can take advantage of. Um, and then 
elder abuse is common. I don't want to say it happens every day, but don't forget about, you know, abuse can occur at any age and any stage. Um, and unfortunately, elders um, have their issues with abuse as well, family members or or have you. So just be just be aware of that new bruises and things of that nature. You want to still look at your patient and, and assess them. And, you know, coping with death and dying as well. As, or there, there are definitely things that um, they may be prone to or what have you. They haven't resolved issues with their aunt or their cousin or what have you. So these are things to be aware of as well. And then mobility, clutter in the kitchen. You, I'm telling you, when you go out and you do your assessment, you're not just assessing the patient, you're assessing everything in that house. Even if you're looking around, you're taking a look, um, you, you're checking out the entire home with permission. Um, you don't wanna go around like moving people's, you know, fine china, what have you, but focus on your primary, secondary, tertiary conditions. I mean, assessments and um, primary, secondary, and tertiary type of teachings and education and training, and you should be fine. You'll, again, you'll, you may have various um, folks coming in and out, like social work and AIDS and what have you. See all drugs, every visit, and med review can save a life. And so are we, have you guys ever done a med review? Anybody ever done a med review before? Ever, 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 what about? Every day. Every day, I hope so. <laughs> Every day, all day. I have a Sandra Hartberger burger. I'm not familiar with you. Hey, have you ever done a med review, dear? <laughs> Every day, all day. All day, fun stuff, isn't it? Oh, you may have been the one that was talking, I'm sorry. Yeah, 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 it literally can save a life. And I'm not even talking about dosages and what have you. I'm looking at expired stuff and get rid of it yeah 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 yeah. they just hold on to it like it's you know like it's gold bullion <laughs> it's not <laughs> it's not it's just something you you recovered from that yeah i might have to fight was well, a hospice nurse you guys are probably like what haven't she done well you you'd be staying nursing for as long as i have for almost next year be 30 years you 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 i like to I like to try new things. So this was a couple of years, couple of years into my nursing career a long time ago. So I love this picture. Um, faith, hospice, nursing, end of life care. You're not, um, usually they're admitted for, um, for hospice back home. They had to have a terminal condition of uh, a year or less to live. I know that sounds, I don't know how it sounds, but there's different criteria for hospice because folks have to come into it and be admitted knowing that you're, you're not doing IV fluids or extending, because that can actually be detrimental or what have you. So um, you are providing definitely education, especially as they're transitioning and what to expect. And then um, of course you're, you're, you're in the beginning, well, oftentimes the patient is more cognitive and able to, you know, converse and what have you, so that you can do your assessment and make sure that you, you know, provide the care that they are they're experiencing. I had one client who's like, I just want to make sure you guys don't let me go. I don't want to be in the hospital. I don't want to tube down my throat. I'm like, okay, you're in, this is hospice. This we have you. What about pain management? And she's like, well, I want to. If I take this much and I then I go to sleep and I want to see my grandkids, so she tolerated a little bit. So work with the patient and 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 the family, everyone. That's one the community. That's your unit there. So the nurse should recognize when the family of a client who is actively dying requires support, and that's just you you you're being aware of what's going on. You're getting you'll get to know the family. You're encouraging family members to discuss their concerns. We'll also support the client. During the dying process, the nurse should encourage the client's family to be present. Nobody wants to die alone. 
However, if a family member voices concerns, the nurse should support the family member by exploring their feelings. So it's a lot of education, a lot of teaching, like, why is mama breathing like that? What does this mean? And they should, you know, they should be prepared and be aware how our bodies transition when we're, when we're dying, what, it, what, what, what they're going to see. Listening attentively to the client and encouraging the client to talk is an appropriate response. Sometimes people just want to talk, which is fine. Even when I see them in office, I don't even like, what brings you in today? And I'll just let them free fall. Just let them boom, boom. Sometimes I have to wheel them back and I let them just go for it. Like, I've been trying to get in and see you. I'm like, okay, okay, okay. I'm here. I'm here. Okay. All right. So, so that's the, the, the biggest thing with hospice. End of life, respectful, dignity, care. Even planning, I mean, I had one client that wanted to, you know, sit down with, no one wants to do this with me. I want to plan what type of flowers I want. I'm like, okay, tell me what you want. I will make sure that it gets done. Now we're switching to community health disasters. We, we covered this more recently, everyone, about preparing your communities for anything and everything. If you're in an area, like when I lived in, I was born and raised in Florida, we had our hurricane seasons. I did re Red Cross disaster training. So we already knew hurricane season, folks, folks around it just get ready. But again, if you're working with a client, what well, any of your client communities, let's say she lives alone or what have you, you're just making sure she has the basics, especially if you already know that something's a tropical storm, then it's a this, then it's a that. So you, you don't want to, you know, come in and, and they're sitting there all alone, they haven't evacuated. So just know that different disasters can take place and that your role as community health nurse is to work with all of the different agencies, but only you wanna make sure that your, your, your individual clients are prepared. That's, that's the primary prevention piece of it. So just, just know that. You're not gonna be that person in the green suit. You know, hopefully you'll be somewhere, but you could be in the, the civic center or what have you, where there's where they've had a makeshift shelter and you're going around, you know, making sure folks have, did you bring the medicines? We bagged up your medicines. Do you have this? Do you have that? So, um, and then what I want to say about this slide, the only note, this is disaster triage, which I guess you could, well, any nurse, uh, especially an RN could take. Uh, take a part in. No, you'll anyone is going to be trained for this, but just know there's different. I don't know what I want to say. Color systems, and um, as far as priority levels, if you notice on the top screen, someone who's deceased over someone who's uninjured is treated and color coded completely differently. So if I were to walk up to Miss Hartberger and she has a white on her, I'm like she's good. Let's get you over here. So you want to keep your colors together and you definitely want to separate your, your top from your bottom. I'll just say that. So just, Sorry. just know that part. Yeah, go ahead, dear. Um, are these colors that you would put on a, a patient? Yeah, they tag them. As identifiers? They tag them. They tag them. Okay. They tag them. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because if, if you have black, Someone's tagged black, you already know they, you know, they're gone. You want to respectfully, there's, I'm sure there's a place that people are put based on that. So if someone's red, I mean, we're not going to get into the disaster triage, but know that if, if everything's all, ah, people are running around, ah, you have to put bands on folks or however they have. So you could quickly identify. So I can scan across the, the as good as my eyes can be and see that she has a green, then maybe she has a laceration or something. She should be with the green people. She should not be with the deceased people. <laughs> I'm not gonna say the word, you can't make me. So, so yeah, 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 yeah. And that way people get quick the care they need in a timely manner and you're not mixing yellow or green with someone who, you know, who's over there who has a cut on their big toe or their little toe when you have someone that's red, who's having an asthma attack and can't breathe. ABCs, ABCs. 
Now I have to take you guys all the way back to season one. <laughs> when we talked about our migrant workers, I have extensive notes, so just bear with me. We should remember this from, what was this, exam one, Ms. Lyons, or exam two, the migrant workers? When did we talk about, maybe it was exam one? I can't remember when we tested on it, but it was super early in the quarter. Okay, okay, no, okay, okay. So how migrant workers risk factors, and the number one thing they have listed here is respiratory. And, and so that only gathers to me is that, that they work with maybe a lot of chemicals that they're inhaling, not on purpose, that sort of thing. They're, they're at risk for a lot of different conditions, but they have respiratory here as well, you know, ABCs, what have you. So Healthy People 2020 Environmental Health Objective that would benefit migrant workers would be to reduce pesticide exposure that results in the need for healthcare access. So they're, being, they're, they're touching pesticides all day long. So then having maybe a some type of mobile clinic. And this, these are like perfect world things. Tracking systems somehow to screen and to detect early exposures um, to these to pesticides would be something to think about. Uh, the physical demands of harvesting crops 12 to 14 hours a day can take a toll on the muscular skeletal system, your back and your neck are the most common types of chronic pain reported by many workers. Look at all that repetitive, up and down, take this, take that. So many workers leave or change their jobs. So the low back pain that, that radiates to one leg, the sciatica, is consistent with a herniate, herniated lumbar disc. So the nurse assesses the client to see whether the pain is aggravated by events that increase intraspinal pressure. So lifting, bending, and again, I know we're not doing nursey, you know, um, clinical stuff, but in the clinic, if I have somebody with sciatica, I have them, I have them bend, I have them stretch back, forth, sideways, so up and down. I do it with them. Let's go up, down, sideways, back, bend, whoop, this, whoop. sneezing, coughing, or by lifting the leg, because these are the repetitive motion movements that started all of this mess in the first place. So just know respiratory ABCs, safety, ABCs. Then you go into, I guess, your, your condition. So migrant worker, number one thing they mentioned is respiratory. And then they talk about, I talk a lot of it about the musculoskeletal. But if you're not breathing, it doesn't worry. Your sciatica is the least of your worries. So think safety, ABCs, and then everything else. And so another thing, because they're, they're working, we're almost towards the end, guys. They're working so many hours. Do they have time to, for leisure or relax and what have you? Because usually, I mean, I worked on a farm. I'm not making this up, guys. I've been working since I was 10 years old. But, you know, you work, you work, you work, you work, you work on sun up, sundown, and that's just part of the life. So um, usually there's a time commitment with the organization. Decreased leisure time, farm workers are, I don't want to say 24 seven, but maybe that's what the slide says. They have to care for livestock. And then just know too that that, is, that in itself gives them very little time to take care of themselves. So let's know that. So now they're talking more, I guess, about not just micro, but rural community. So clients in rural communities have an overall decrease in health status. We talked about it in my class when compared to urban clients. Rural clients are less likely to participate in activities during leisure, probably too tired. Decreased compliance with safety precautions, you know, that keep them safe on the farm, such as wearing the seat belts and um, preventative health screening. They're like preventative what? So chronic conditions, unfortunately, are more prevalent in your rural migrant communities compared to your urban communities. Um, clients who live in a rural community, they know each other. So people are in folks' business. And sometimes that's a lot of times where they don't want to go to the local clinic when they see a rash down there. Um, there's a lack of anonymity. 
in these rural areas. And then I have clients again, they they don't like this particular family member from this particular tribe. So they don't come into the clinic because they know that Betty Sue works there. So they're far less likely to report sexual assault, drug use, depression, um, based on the concern that others in the community will know their business. And that is so true, it's a small town. When identifying resources for older clients who live in rural communities, it says that the nurse should focus on barriers to healthcare access. So transportation usually is huge in most rural areas, getting into the clinic. Um, and so working with different transportation systems. So I know one of the things we did on the reservation, it used to would only go out to certain remote areas at certain times. So we begged and pleaded and begged and pleaded and we would coordinate with them. So if they knew that this person was coming in, we would try to make the appointments in the afternoon. You just, I don't wanna nitpick it, but they have to have a way to get into the clinic, especially with being rural. Um, and we're not even gonna talk about the specialty appointments in town. It can be challenging, but don't, don't give up on it. So a little bit about um, substance abuse. So substance abuse, all right, so then you're thinking, look at your primary. This is a perfect little screen somebody put together. One of my, probably one of, one of our colleagues. So you're looking at primary, you're looking at preventing the initial use. They haven't snorted, sniffed, none of that. And then secondary, you're trying to do early detection of or reduce reduction of substance use once problems have already begun. And then tertiary is you're reducing substance use problems or harms to prevent further deterioration or death. So I know looking at this looks like, okay, what's the difference between secondary and tertiary? I don't, again, I don't think anyone wants to trip anyone up on any test. I should certainly hope not. So if I was looking at secondary and tertiary, I would focus on the detection because that's what secondary really truly is. You're trying to detect it. And so that's that's what you're doing. And there's different, there's different screening tests. You got, and I don't know what they would do, but we we do blood tests and urine tests and stuff. And if it's identified, then you're you're dealing with tertiary and you're reducing that use, reducing the harms. Let's just say I have pregnant women that are on that, that are um Method, they're on methadone, so you're trying to reduce harm and complications and death at that point. So just know that pretty much with everything, there's a primary, secondary, tertiary, primary, prevent, secondary, detect, or screen, tertiary, reduce use, reduce harm. They have it. How can they live the best possible life now that they have it? Can they cut back and Instead of five times a day to one time a day, and then eventually no times a day. So, so that's what you're that's what you're focusing on. Um, so it says here, my, let me just go over my little note. It says secondary prevention involves early identification for early intervention, the use of a behavioral risk factor survey allows a nurse to identify individuals at risk for substance abuse or individuals already using it. So I, I, I'm assuming there's tools out there to determine if they're at risk or if they're already using it. So that's how you detect. And then you switch you quickly over to tertiary at that point. You may not stay in secondary for just a minute. because you don't know unless someone tells you I use meth or I use cocaine. That makes sense. Drug education in elementary school is primary provision. This is an example. Rehabilita rehabilitation and counseling for addicts is tertiary prevention. So let's say they don't tell you. Um, and so you do a screening. And so for me, I'll just keep it really easy. I'll do, you know, folks like, I'm not using, I'm not using. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then I check your pee and it's full of cocaine. So I have found it, well, let's not be, let's be honest with each other. Now, do you want help? No, I don't. I said, okay, well, I can't tertiary you until <laughs> so you're ready for me to tertiary you. 
I have a rehab place that says they'll take you. Let me know when you're ready. Two weeks later, I'm ready. Now you're in tertiary. You go over to Cactus Rehab for moms. I don't know, someplace. Does that make sense? No? Yes, maybe. All right, let's move on. And I'm going to, I want to leave time for questions. Oh my goodness, Paris. Is it almost time for class to be over? Yes. I feel like I've been talking 10 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Elizabeth's like, yeah. And oh my gosh, we're almost done, but I was going to, okay, let me, let me, I'll stay on if anybody wants to stay on with me. Okay, we're at slide 50. I want to say there's 52. All right, let me, 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 let me. All right, so substance abuse. Okay, let me just, and I'm just going to stick to my notes because the, the slides are there to, 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 to entertain you, but let me, let me educate you. So substance abuse, what can we be, what can be abused? What is at risk? Look at, think about alcohol and vitamins. I know B vitamins can, certain vitamins can be drained from, from chronic alcohol use. Um, smoking and vaping are huge concerns as well. So when you're implementing population specific health promotion, the nurse should focus on lifestyle risk factors specific to the population. So, you know, this is not a MPH class, but you, you want whatever you do to be effective. You just don't wanna be like nilly willy and pull up something and it's not gonna hit the target. So then, and that's why you have people, you're not doing everything by yourself, but for college students, treatment options for smoking cessation would be appropriate. Let's just say you're targeting college students. Exercise classes, education on stress reduction. Let's just say people are stressed. Conducting surveys for environmental hazards are priority for adult clients. So there's, so they, it's all over the place, but you wanna, Make sure when you're dealing with any issue that you're that you're actually your intervention is specific to what you're trying to do. If not, when you go evaluated, it, it's not going to be like why are people still vaping. Um, so then, a client who uses alcohol in excessive amounts is at risk for decreased vitamin twelve, B twelve, and folic acid. Chronic alcohol consumption can cause confusion, malnourished. So again, making sure they're getting the nutrients that they need. Um, caffeine abuse is a, you know, it's not illegal, but don't think about energy drinks. When I see like moms come in with energy drinks, it just breaks my heart when they're pregnant. It just, I literally <laughs> breaks my heart. Um, so a lot of education and teaching that the, the complications of cardiac and all of that caffeine in your baby and this, that, and the other, and what have you. Uh, vaping oil used to deliver the nicotine contains high concentration of nicotine and may be poisonous to young children if they consume this oil orally. This counseling should be prioritized in a home with young children. The addictive appealing properties and the risk of secondhand vapor exposure are not immediately life-threatening. So you, you think, oh my gosh, people should know this, but sometimes they don't. So or you just want to say it again and again in like a broken record. Homelessness, a lot of you guys did your vulnerable population as well. I won't spend too much time on it. Let's just say they have a lot of needs. And so if you're a community health nurse and you're working with a agency that works with um, homeless folks, that is your population and you will know the resources you need to help them. Um, Think of things like if it's if it's cold outside, there's shelters, and you want to make sure people are, are getting knowing where they need can go when they're not out there freezing to death, literally. And then a little bit about the cycle of abuse that's listed here for you. Communication is the first thing we learn as a child, but as we grow older, it becomes the hardest thing to do. And so recognizing abuse, and for me, it's always like, I don't know, if, if folks feel comfortable with talking to you, they'll talk to you about anything. Look at signs, look at marks, look at everything. I'm not making eye contact or what have you. Again, you're not, if, you, if you ever become a community health nurse, you're not going to be like seasoned right off the bat. So you'll, you'll be with other senior nurses. But just know that, again, um, know that it's an issue. Elder abuse child abuse, teen abuse is out there and just be aware of it. I'm not gonna to spend too much time because on the slide here, 
because we just really talked about um, uh, the chronic, chronic abuse in our community last couple of weeks ago, what have you. So know that you wanna listen. You don't wanna be accusing. You don't want to be judgmenting, judgmental, stereotyping or none of those. So know what's effective communication, even in your daily life. Um, when I see a patient start going in like this, I'm like, oh, okay, let me, let me change how, I don't know, whatever I'm doing that's making them wanna fold their arms up at me. Um, so, and then, can you guys still hear me? Yes? One of my earbuds stopped working. I could tell it in my ear. And then culture, we'll talk a little bit about that as well. As far as with our Native Americans, I can, I can, I can tell you a lot about working with Native Americans and culture. You're our guest on their land and you should be respectful and learn their cultures and their norms and you just always be humble. So clients that are Native Americans are often past oriented. We talked about this in my class, past oriented and may not be concerned about the future. I have said that before and it's on my notes. Instructing the client to call three weeks for a follow -up appointment is an action that is future oriented. For this client, the nurse should, be, should schedule an appointment that should be more specific for Current. The nurse should provide specific instructions with a time frame for the client. Don't try to memorize what I just said. The only thing you need to know is what we talked about before. Native Americans are past oriented and may not be concerned with the future. So if you know that and you schedule somebody a month out, that's the future. So you need to somehow figure out how to get that person in. And whatever I what I do, if I have if I do, because the, the world schedule in the future. I do have my MA call, especially if I know, again, not every Native American is traditional. I'll say, can you call Miss Lyons, you know, just, can you just call her, you know, before this afternoon, just let her remind her or the day before or something like that. If not, people just don't show up and then, or what have you. So no, past oriented and not concerned with the future. And that, we got through this with no minutes to spare. Thank you guys so much. I'm not going to keep anyone. Um, it was a pleasure being your instructor. You will not see this face again until uh, not next week. You have your HESI. And then the following week, please email me. I'm not going to beg because you guys know. Um, and so it is. <laughs> 